Hi friends, welcome to Blade and Broom Botanica. I am Lorelai Black. In this episode we're going to talk about altars and shrines and the difference between the two and how they are sometimes a very blended space for a lot of folks and why that is. In its very basic definition, an altar is a place of sacrifice and offering. Historically, that would have been some type of platform or um, table or construct. Um, it might have been a pile of stones. It might have been a brazier of some kind. It might have been a place where an animal was slaughtered and butchered and then either um, parts were burned and given to the gods and then the rest was consumed by the community. Um, like for instance at a hog roast um, or something like that that still very much happens in today's culture in a secular setting um, but if you were to put that in terms of a, of, a, of a church setting where they were having you know come on down to the church hog roast um, they might very well say a prayer over that over that hog and then you know somebody from the church community would go and um, you know slaughter the hog and nobody would really bat an eye about that they wouldn't consider like oh my god they sacrificed the pig call the newspapers and alert them to this tragedy that's happening but you know if we do it ah. anyway i digress but um <laughs> that's still essentially all that happened in ancient times and even in modern contexts where pagan heathen vudan groups are doing this Usually it's still that the animals being slaughtered in a way that's still in keeping with custom and then parts of it are being given to the gods and most frequently parts of it are being consumed among the people. Um, it's not just sort of this blood orgy <laughs> of, of, you know, gore. Anyway. There are other types of altars, too, in which the sacrifice is not necessarily a live sacrifice, right? So um, other types of sacrifices that get made, got made traditionally and get made now, are sacrifices of fruits and grains. In fact, we see in Biblical Testament where Cain attempted to make uh, a perfect offering of his harvest and was rejected very soundly for having done so. Well, considering that Cain is the um, considered the progenitor of a lot of witchcraft traditions, including uh, traditional witchcraft for the most part, um, that is very often what we're doing on our altars: is we're making um, we're making offerings quite frequently of grains, of fruits, of vegetables, of wine, of bread, of that type of thing. So um, when we're slaughtering our sacrifices, we're very often plunging a knife into a loaf of bread. We're very often slitting the throat of a cup of wine, or we're pouring that wine um, over an altar stone or a, uh, a bottle of beer over an anvil stone or something along those lines. So these sacrifices are still very real sacrifices, but they are not, you know, opening a vein of ourselves or of uh, an animal onto an altar. Other types of traditional sacrifices that we see in ancient culture are incense sacrifices. So I'll cite references to Aphrodisian altars or altars to Aphrodite. Uh, again, historically, there would be um, places to offer incense. And again, this happens throughout the world in other cultures. Um, we see, you know, places, beautiful, beautiful incense altars where you either have sticks or you have a brazier of some kind where you can sprinkle loose incense, um, you know, so that that smoke wafts up to the gods, you know, and with it often prayers are being taken. And that's often the purpose behind an altar is that it's a place of devotion and it's a place where votive offerings are made. That votive means that a vow goes with it. So when I'm making an offering in that context, um, I'm giving something and asking for something in return. Um, 
So we see this still in the Catholic Church, for instance, where there are votive candles that are being lit. And we see, you know, these beautiful racks of candles. It is, if you, if you do this for me, I promise to do that for you. And that is the concept behind that. Well, we find throughout, um, again, throughout world cultures, we see in all these places where there are um, votive offerings that have been made, for instance, in wells and lakes where um, trinkets have been thrown in um, in sacrifice or an offering to the, the god of that place or the goddess of that place where the person making that offering or making that sacrifice has said um, to the, in, the dwelling god there made whatever promise it was that they made in exchange for that token or with the hope of that token but that's how the prayer was made so very often altars are raised places so they're raised up off the ground in some way um, whether that's a raised table type structure um, often of stone sometimes metal um, or they might even be a raised building so when we see that a lot of times um, in these pyramidal structures right all over the world we see that um, a lot of times the altars mimic that same sort of shape but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case most of the time it is but not always sometimes altars are right on the ground and every now and then altars are dug into the ground most of the time though when we see altars on the ground or in the ground they're actually altars that are in service to um, what we call chthonic deities or underworld deities um, because that's the most direct route to make the offering is um, to get close to the ground so if you're making an offering to a deity that you envision as being part of the upper world or the other world, you know, celestial beings, you want to get it up high. <laughs> so even if even if your altar's not somehow very, very elevated, um, usually the altar is still um, at some sort of height. It's, it's on a table or something. Um, but if you're wanting to make an offering that's going to be to the underworld in some way, um, to the dead or to... Um, the deities of the dead, then you want to get low. You want to dig a hole. You want to at least put it on the ground, make your stone on the ground. Is what we've seen traditionally. Now, there are always exceptions to the rules, so, you know, feel free to some extent to make your altar how you want it and how you see it. So what's the difference between that and a shrine? A shrine is seen as a place where a god dwells or a spirit dwells it's a place that is sacred um, or a place that is um, intended to be sacred a place that is set out to be sacred so it's either already sacred because it's recognized by a person or by a group of people as being um, a place that has a god living there or a spirit living there some kind of force is recognized and people just start um, acknowledging it and um, sort of decorating it bringing things to it maybe um, or or otherwise denoting it as being holy or it might be a place for instance within your home where you set aside space to give homage or homage to that which is holy to you so um, that bookshelf um, where you have a little space to set up a shrine to Carnunos might not inherently have already been holy. It was just an Ikea bookshelf. But you decided that that was going to be the space for Carnunos. So now it is holy because you put an icon of Carnunos there and you brought an antler that you found and cleaned and you hung... Um, a, a horned necklace that you made and strung some beads with and and burned a sigil onto and now you have invited Kernunos to come and dwell there at his will at his will and sometimes he does and now it is holy and so maybe you make offerings I hope you do <laughs> but maybe you don't um I hope you do <laughs> um but now it is a shrine. Shrines tend to be less functional than altars. 
because you're not typically doing spell work, magic, ritual, that type of thing there. Altars tend to be places where work happens because you're, you're making those sacrifices, you're making those offerings there. And so they tend to be places of ritual in this day and age. So maybe once upon a time, they were just places of sacrifice to the gods. Um, but now, in a modern context, there are also places where um, modern pagans and witches are keeping their other tools, their other working items, and they're actually doing the ceremony and ritual around their crafts. Ceremony and ritual always happen at the altars of old as well. A shrine is a consecrated and dedicated space to a god or a spirit or an idea, perhaps. And an altar is a workshop table, in a sense, for spells and rituals, and it is that offering space for the magic that's being done, or for the working that is happening. I would definitely still make the argument that both still need sacrifices and offerings to keep them alive and activated. However, I would also say that trads vary widely on this, as far as what offerings are appropriate and in what ways they're made. If you need some guidance though, some basic things that you can keep in mind are that uh, fire is very often used, such as a candle flame, to keep the altar space warm, but I don't recommend keeping a candle lit unattended on your altar. So if you're going to bed, if you're walking uh, out of the house, snuff that candle. Smoke sweetens the space and is generally considered a good offering. Uh, typically, you want to use sweet smokes like the resinous incenses, frankincense, myrrh, copal, are almost universally welcome as offerings, even where they weren't known, um, in cultures where they weren't used, they're probably going to be well received. Milk, spring water, beer, liquor, Again, these are almost always universally well received by spirits and by the gods as liquid offerings. When in doubt, ask what they like in terms of a drink. In terms of foods, meats and grains and fruits are usually well received. Some deities really have specific things that they like and that they resonate with. Same with some spirits, candies that type of thing. So um, if you're not sure, you can research or you can ask. They are often very vocal about what it is that they like. Fresh flowers, tobacco, these often are very well received as well. In terms of actual altar space, traditional craft is eminently practical and tends not to get overloaded in terms of what they bring to the altar. So you're really only going to find on the altar what it is that you need for the ritual, typically. Again, specific working traditions or covens may vary from group to group. So typically what you'll find in terms of tool placement and that type of thing is that um, certain working tools will either be centrally located or in a particular direction, depending on the working that's being done. But again, you're only going to have the tools that are absolutely necessary, even called for in the ritual. So it's funny, I know in my own tradition, the Spiral Castle tradition, or as it's known a little bit more commonly, the American folkloric tradition, that's how we wrote about it on our blog most of the time. Um, we had ideas when we first started writing about all these tools that we were going to use and all this paraphernalia and regalia that we were going to have. And as we actually started working with the tradition, um, we were less and less about this stuff. My own teacher and initiator used to say, and I've always held with this philosophy, if you can't do it naked in a concrete box with nothing, you can't do it. So the tools are a good focal point but they're not the point. Um, and traditional craft, I think, has always held that to heart. Uh, tools are a good thing for you to use to get used to how the energy works. But it's not the tool doing the job. It's you doing the job. 
and the altar is a focal point for where that offering is going. And that's all a little different than the personal shrines, even of traditional witches. <laughs> As you can see. <laughs> um, and I'll take a picture of this. Um, there's a lot going on here, and so um, so I think one of the things that happens is that because space ends up being limited for a lot of folks, and um, a lot of people don't have access to be able to go out into nature to do ritual the way that they want to, they do more restricted, um, sort of contained ritual in front of or near a shrine space or a combined altar shrine space within their home. So I'm going to use the example of my shrine that's behind me and really this space um, is much more of a shrine. I'll show uh, a full picture of this three or four level, it's really a four level <laughs> shrine um, for you to get a, a full idea of what's happening. but. Um, and I do inner work here. I do meditative work. I do some of my spell work here, and I do some of my work in other spaces that are in my home. But whenever possible, I'm actually going outside and creating or, or using an already established altar space or taking my staying with me. Um, which is the much more common experience, and that is my altar, right? So I, I raise the stang, lay the compass, and that's my space. That's my altar. And when I take it down, that altar doesn't exist anymore. So, or it does, but it's brought back with me. And that's the case for most traditional witches. Again, eminently practical. This space is always here, and it always exists, and it's always sacred but it is not the same kind of space as when I'm doing ritual out there. Um, and those are major distinctions. So, but if you're an urban, if you're an urban dweller, and I am kind of, I'm on the edges of an urban population, that's hard to do. It's harder to do. So uh, a lot of us are having to make do, right? We're having to do what we can in the spaces that we can. And so we're having those reality shifts in front of spaces like this or in front of spaces that are small, a lot smaller than this, you know, that are maybe just a, a table that we've erected or an end table that's next to our beds or, um, you know, um, that we've just established for the time being on our bed um, and then we have to put it away because you know maybe we're living in a stealth situation and, and we can't have people know what we're doing um, so we have to get creative and I think um, I think some of the tools of traditional witchcraft like the staying which can be absolutely portable make that easier to do but um, and shrines can be stealthy because we can certainly have a shrine in a wall space or a shrine in a bookcase um, that's not going to look like a shrine to somebody else but we know exactly what's happening with that interesting and eccentric collection of stuff <laughs> it's thrumming with energy for us it's thrumming with the power of the god that we've invoked there so that's the difference between shrines and altars and how they often get blended because there are not neat categories sometimes for things. Being a witch is messy very often. All right, so I hope that you found some of the information in today's episode useful. I would love to see pictures of your altars and shrines and hear how you're using your spaces. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook, tag me in your comments, share photos and all that jazz. I'd love to see what you're doing. Subscribe, like, share, do all the things, follow the links and whatnot. I've got all kinds of info for you today. And 
I'll see you Monday at noon, new episodes.